Click that. Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lo Liebenberg. I'm the CEO of PayProf in North America. It's lovely to have you all um, on this webinar. Thanks for joining us. Um, we, we're going to slowly get started. Um, we know everyone is really busy and we, um, we want to respect everyone's time. So we, we're going we're gonna to get going. We know people always join sort of halfway through or not halfway through, a few minutes in. But I want to thank you to a growth webinar. I mean, growth is, growth is why we're all in this market. If we were all in, in property management business to run the same portfolio tomorrow that we ran today, then it's quite a boring life. Um, and we've always prided ourselves on helping our clients free up their time so that they can automate what needs to be automated so they can actually grow their businesses. And we tracked this growth figure religiously um, a few years ago, it was 23% and 26%. But we found our growth numbers in the US, and, and when I say US, it's actually North America, Canada, and, and the US, have been phenomenal since we launched. Um, we're sitting on an average growth rate of about 36% year on year. And when we talk about that, that is literally calendar year versus calendar year, volume processed in terms of rental. So that's a, that's a lot of money in terms of growth, like a third larger than you were, than you were last year. And um, so, so we've had a lot of exposure to these type of clients. We've got thousands of clients throughout the world. And we wanted to just share with you some of, not just our views on growth, but some of our clients' views on growth. And, and that's really what today's about. And it's a really informal session. So it's, there's a, like literally eight slides that I want to show you about growth. And then we're going to talk about growth in a more practical way. We're going to talk about Eric and Marwan, who are joining us, that, um, that talks about how they did it, because ultimately that's what it's about. It's not about me telling you the theory of growth. It's about someone telling you, well, this is how I've done it. And, 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 and you guys are free to ask any questions you want to ask. This is a great opportunity to learn and ask and, and to, to see how it can grow. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and share my screen with you. Um, and just show you a little bit. I know we, we call it this magical formula about growth. And, and before I go any further, I need to do all the disclaimers. I'm not a lawyer. Some of the things that we're going to talk about has have legal implications. So if you see anything that you wonder about, ask your lawyer. Um, I'm just giving you the view after a decade in paper, after helping thousands of clients and seeing thousands of them grow. Um, that's purely what this view is about. So I have to say that myself and everyone else presenting here are not lawyers, unless Eric and Marwan are secretly lawyers. But if they are, they're not giving you legal advice. Um, so I, I need to give you a little bit of a background. To, 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 and, and I always give background, not just um, because I like talking about us as a company, but so that you can understand where the message comes from, that I'm not, we're not sitting in a basement somewhere and making this up, but that we actually have got years and years worth of experience of managing rental funds for property brokers. So we, we, we've been around since 2004 and we're in Canada, US, South Africa, and, the, and, and um, we've got offices in Switzerland as well, but they don't process property funds. And we process about $3 billion per annum um, in rental funds. So we see a lot of money go through the system and we do it for large clients and well-known clients, but most importantly, we do it through integration with, with banks. So when we talk to you about money and money flows. We're not talking to you about it in an accounting sense or in a theoretical sense. Together with the banks, we actually process the funds. So we actually see where the money goes. We actually see what's being paid. So when we look at a trend, we really understand intimately what sits behind that trend because we look at where the money goes. And ultimately, this game is all about money, right? Um, we've, we, we didn't start where we are today. We started actually as a nonprofit. Um, it's, it's a beautiful company that you should please go look up. Um, after this, um, it's called Give and Gain. And, and Give and Gain gives you the opportunity to use the same transactional software that you used to on paper to make donations to good causes in 193 countries across the world. Um, we only facilitate donations to registered causes who are registered in the country that they are as nonprofits so that um, you know your cause money goes to a curated cause that really exists and the money goes to the right place and it does it in a transparent way. And as you can see, we do it for for a couple of massive brands. And the ones we, we're really excited about is Given Game could just select it as the, 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 the donation processing partner for the 125th Boston Marathon. Um, and that's just like a massive way to get into the US. It's our first really big US client that we have as, as Given Game. And to be chosen in, in, in the entire market as the guys to process the funds for such a prestigious marathon is just incredible for us. 
So this is where we are today. Let me get into the meat of it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about growth basics, and I apologize for a bit of the theory, but some of it is quite important. And then we're going to talk to two people who have actually done this. Um, and that's a facilitated discussion to see, you know, how did they do it? And, and I want to really beg you to ask questions because to sit with someone who's done this live and in real time is, um, is a, a massive and a rare opportunity to get. Um, and they're opening up their businesses to us in that sense. And you know how people are about information and things they hold on to. So we really want to thank them for, for the way in which they share. So I'm just going to get into growth basics. I mean, basically, if you think about growth in this portfolio, and we're all, we're all in the same game, right? It's a basic formula. It's how many properties you have, what the average rental is, at what commission, plus what other money you can make of it, minus your admin expenses. It's, it's, it's a really basic formula. I mean, we, we run these businesses all over the world, and everywhere we go, it looks exactly the same. You either talk to you about agents about how I get you more properties, or how do I get you to get properties that are higher rentals, or how do I get you to charge more commission? Or how do I get you to add more income? Or how do I diminish your expenses? And we found that people pull these levers in different ways and that you can't pull them all at the same time and that the implications for which levers you try to pull in your business. And I'm briefly gonna talk about those. So this comes all from experience. Everything that I'm showing you comes from things we've seen people do. So the first thing that people do is they say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push the number of properties that I manage at the cost of everything else. Um, and it's great that you wanna push the number of properties that you have on your portfolio, but at the cost of everything else is where the problem sits. So for example, we often see people go into a market and say, I'm gonna drop my commission from 8% to 10% to make myself more attractive to landlords because you know landlords love a good deal. But the part that you forget is if I've got a thousand dollar rental, and I drop from 8% commission or 10% commission to an 8% commission. So the landlord is now not getting $920, $900. He's now getting $920. That's a 2% gain for the landlord. But you've given away 20% of your income. And somewhere that scale doesn't fit anymore. No landlord is just going to move to you for $20 more, but you have to sacrifice 20% of your commission income to get that. So some of these strategies that people employ, you really just need to think about carefully, sum it out, go take the calculator and break it down. So, well, if I do this, what do I give away? And what do I get in return? And is it what I'm giving really good enough for a landlord to make the move? Is a landlord really gonna choose me over another property manager for an extra 2% in income? I, 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 I sincerely doubt it. Um, the second thing that we see people do is that they take on a lot of business without setting up the infrastructure. So it typically happens when you suddenly hit with a development and you need to add on 50 units. And we talk about this law of diminishing returns. We often come across clients who, when we start speaking to them, they're, they're, they say, I've got 52 units. And if you interrogate the, the situation a little bit more, then you say, well, how long have you had around there? I mean, and then they tell you, well, I had 54, then 53, then 47, then 49, then 51, then 43. And, and there seems to be this theme around 50s that we pick up a lot that people, have a capacity that a human being has to do administrative tasks that says, you know, at around 50 properties, I, I, it's too much for me as an administrator with Excel. And then I start dropping my service to my landlords and then landlords leave me and I'm sort of lose three properties again. I, I struggle to get through this 50 barrier. And the more properties I start adding without adding the infrastructure, I actually get diminished return for my efforts. I, I'm working harder, but I'm losing owners as I'm not able to serve each owner properly individually. And then I start suffering long-term reputational damage. So I'm saying it's really great. And Eric will tell us today and Marlon will tell us today about how we, um, how we add property to our portfolios. The, the, the warning bell we want to just put up there is to say, be careful how you approach growth. Some strategies are smarter than others. Dropping your commission is, is, is never a smart strategy. And just going random growth at the expense of all else is also not a great idea. Um, when I, when I then go to changing market segments, so sometimes people go and they say, you know, another way for me to grow my business is to um, actually try to get to a higher rental. So if you remember the formula is number of units multiplied by the average rental value. Maybe if I go into luxury rentals, I'll do better. Or maybe if I go into managed rentals, I'll do better. Maybe if I go into commercials, I'll do better. Because those are, or maybe I go into holiday lettings. Those are generally the four things people try over and above the standard single family housing rental that they do, that, that, that they consider this for, you know, uh, I'm gonna try to luxury, I'm gonna try to get into commercial, 
I'm, I'm going to try to get into manage, I'm going to try and get in vacation. So, so those are the four things I try. Um, be, be, because the math is simple, you know, 10% of $1,000 is much less than 10% of $3,000. You know, I can make three times more if I just get a higher rental value in there. There is, however, often an expectation that comes with the more. You need to be able to do more to justify that fee in the eye of the landlord. So what is the more that I'm offering to justify a three times greater cash earning on the same transaction, you know, transactional effort? Um, and then the other really great strategy that we see is, is moving to manage rentals from introduction rentals. A lot of people have, have blended portfolios and a lot of people just do, I'm going to introduce my tenant and hand them on to the landlord. By moving your business from just finding tenants and passing them on, you move from an 8% to a 10% at minimum. Some people then charge the 8 plus the 10. But if you just go from a once of 8 to an, an, an annualized 10, you're making 25% more gross income by just making that move. Now, people tell me, well, is 25% more income worth the additional effort? And that's where things like automation come in. And I'm not going to try and sell you on automation because you know that's what we do. But if you're able to just move from that business model to a managed business model, you can extract a lot more gross income from the same activity. Essentially, your hardest part in your tenancy is finding a good tenant and placing that good tenant. The easier part, if you're automated, is the transactional component of it. And then the third thing about getting into different categories is, is, is commercial. Uh, a lot of people go into commercial as a side. Um, and, and it's a, it's a, it's very high rental values, um, but it's a different type of client that requires a different type of skill set with a different type of infrastructure and often very different type of reporting. So while it's it's often tempting to just take on business like that at face value and to say, yeah, that sounds great, I'm going to take it on. Really sit down with the prospective client and understand what their demands are, because we've seen a lot of people jump into industries they don't understand for the sake of getting to a higher rental income bracket, and then it not working out because they didn't understand the guy wants a balance sheet or they want monthly inspections or they want an on-site manager. It's really about taking apart what the obligation is in the segment. Because we, you know, if, if you're in single family housing, you understand it inside and out. If you suddenly go into holiday rentals, there's different tax implications, there's different reporting implications, there's different ways to deal with the past. So it's about really in interrogating this new industry that you, you want to get into. Um, some of the other pitfalls to look at is, is, is changing up commission structures. So, so we've seen we've seen a, a, a lot of ways that people try to change the commission structure. So I've, I've spoken about dropping commission, which I think is a terrible thing to do because you lose more than your landlord gains. Um, we've seen how people almost charge the double commission that they say, I'm going to charge you the 8% for finding someone and then I'm going to charge you 10% to manage someone. Um, We've also seen some clients do something really cool, which is like a differentiated menu where they say, well, you know, at 9%, I'm going to do this for you. At 10%, I'm going to do this for you. And at 12%, I'm going to do that for you. And they, and they actually give an owner a type of a menu and they say, well, if you want monthly inspections, that's going to cost extra. If you want this, it's going to cost you extra. The trick has always just been to stick to that because we're in an industry where we love to please the landlords. And you sometimes get into the trap where you would sign a landlord on a cheaper commission, but they expect the higher level of service. So that's why putting it in documentation beforehand, like a type of a brochure, is a really good idea. Um, we've seen people going into higher commission industries. Now, this is interesting. Um, we've seen a lot of people try to get into the Airbnb space, where the commissions are higher. I mean, sometimes they go up to 20%. Um, and we've seen people start entire new business ranges just by adding Airbnb to their businesses, um, doing short-term lettings for people who don't want to do long-term lets anymore. It's crashed a little bit in, in, in COVID, but it's, it's something that seems to be picking up again. Um, and the only advice that we have there is understand that you need to have a different staffing structure. Um, understand that currently this drain on your business for doing annual inspections or biannual inspections is multiplied by every tenancy that you have. So every time someone moves in, I need to check that the place is fine. Every time they move out, I need to change the linen and make sure that it's clean. So it's just, it's being conscious about the fact that you're getting more commission, but you're going to work harder for it and you're going to work more frequently for it. But if you're okay with that, the specialization often works really well for people. Um, adding more income. Now, now, now this to us is a really smart move. We've often seen people that um, say, well, there's commission. That's really great to get, but I'm going to add all these other things to my business. And Eric's going to tell us a little bit about that. Um, 
we've seen two types. On, on the one is adding additional services and the other is adding additional fees. So we've seen, I think my worst was I've seen a, a landlord that had 16 different type of tenancy fees that they were distributing throughout the lease. You know, everything from a late fee to inspection fee to a pet fee to a, a processing fee to an administration fee to a, there were 16 fees in their addendum. Now that gets ridiculous. Um, but that said, there are places that you can add on additional fees to recover work that you have done. I've seen clients that argue with tenants about the fact that, you know, if I have a, a, a platform like PayPop that allows me to pay bills that technically you should be paying, you need to pay me for that convenience. So we have seen clients actually on charge administrative fees for paying bills on behalf of the tenant. The argument being, my mandate is with the owner. And my mandate with the owner is purely, I'm going to invoice you and I'm going to get your rent. What you are asking me to do is to pay your expenses. And I'm not going to do that for free. So we've seen people have that argument. But my, my, my pleading with you is that always check the legality of any fee that you're going to charge. We've seen so many people get into trouble because they've randomly added fees onto tenants. Um, and then it's never in the lease. Your, 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 your founding document is your lease. And if your lease allows you to do it, and it is legal in the state that you're trading in, fantastic, lovely, keep going add fees on, distribute the cost, that's great. But before you do that, because it sounds really nice to say, well, I haven't charged lease fees or renewal fees or late fees or admin fees or bill payment fees or pick fees or inspection fees. I can, I can add all these things. And I promise you, they make a massive difference to your business when you start doing them. If you've got 100 tenants and every tenant pays an extra $2.50 a month, that's an extra $250. That's like $3,000. That's your holiday paid for right there. But it is about knowing, may I do this legally? And does my lease allow for it? So, so just check your lease before you, you go in there. And then the last one is always a contentious one because everything else has been about growth. It's all been about, do I go into extra sectors to make more money? Do I um, add more units? Do I do different types of units to manage letting? Do I, what do I add, 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 add? But at the subtraction time is, can I, can I just do what I'm doing now at a lower cost? Um, and there are various strategies with, with, with different success. I mean, so the one, the, the one is always to, to say, it's not about getting rid of staff. We, we're not for that. We're not for people saying, oh, I'm going to fire people the moment I automate. It really is about saying, well, if I automate and I free up time on my staff, what else can they do with that? Um, and we've seen a few strategies here. So, so what we've seen with saving on administration expenses, there's a couple of ways to free up time. Now, we would always tell you automating non-value activities, adding activities is the best way to do it because your staff gets to actually focus on the things that make a difference, that require judgment, that require care, skill, and client relationships. That's always great. Um, they shouldn't be going to the bank and making payments and depositing checks and sitting on Excel all day. That, that's non-value added. Another way, and this is for people who are on this call or paper clients, a very successful way of spreading the administrative load. I mean, remember, you've got unlimited users for whom you can assign very specific permissions. We've seen large organizations devolve some of that responsibility to agents. Now, I know what you're thinking the moment I say that you get sort of the ice cold chill that says, I'm not gonna let my agents work on my accounting system in my life. But if you, if you work with your permissions really finely, you can get to a place that you can get agents to chase arrears. You can get agents to load basic property details, but still have your back office team do the accounting and the finance and the approvals and the payments. You can really refine visibility on paper so that some people can only see the things that specifically relate to them. But there's a way of democratizing work in your organization that you spread your administrators load across more people so that everyone does a little bit. And because the information is real time on the same platform at the same time, that changes a lot for you. You can actually do that quite effectively. So to summarize, I, I, growth is about how do I get more at a higher value? How do I offer services that warrant me to get a higher commission? How do I add in extra costs? And how do I do all of those things and pay less for it? And, and I suppose if you get that right, that's the magic formula, right? If you can double your book without doubling your expenses and add additional income and up your commission, you know, you, 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 you sit. So that's the theory. But I'm less interested in the theory than how it actually happened. So I want to introduce you to, to, to Eric. Now, Eric has been, um, is, is from Orange List. He'll introduce us in a, in a second. And, and Eric has been a paper client for, for a while. And I'm, rather than me trying to tell you, Eric, what, um, what it's all about, I'm going to just introduce you and ask you to tell us a little bit about your business. First of all, man, uh, thanks for having me here today. 
Um, excited to tell you guys a little bit about Orangeless, which is a full service property management company based in the Niagara region in Canada. Um, we saw about 15 minutes uh, from Buffalo. So, uh, as Lo mentioned, we've been uh, we've been working with PayProp now for uh, about three and a half years. I think that's accurate, and that was a big game changer for us. So, first of all, we've uh, we started Orange List uh, six years ago. I was in my last semester uh, at university when I met Brian at my part-time job at Telus. Um, I sold him on a on a BlackBerry warranty, and uh, he asked me if I ever thought about real estate. And uh, I said, no, not really, but I was interested. He was a cool guy, and we began uh, putting some ideas together. Um, I was helping him. Uh, Brian was selling real estate, investment real estate, and his clients needed those properties rented. Uh, and Brian, being as busy as he was, didn't have the, the time or the resources to do it. So I came on board. I began kind of renting those houses for him. Uh, and then we noticed uh, those people would be speaking to people, that, the other investors in their network that, that enjoyed the way we did things, the quality of tenants in which we were placing in these homes. Um, and we realized there was a huge demand in our area for, for these types of services. So we began cold calling people on Kijiji, which is a, a big rental platform here in, uh, I believe it's North America, but it's, it's huge here in, in Canada. So I would cold call these, these owners and say, hey, you know, my name's Eric you know, your ad isn't that great. I can do it better than you can. Um, and uh, some people liked the way that I approached that, some didn't, but either way, it got us here today. Uh, and we began picking up a lot of business. Now, from that leasing service that we were offering, people, people wanted more. People didn't want to be involved in the day-to-day -day, um, uh, tasks of being a landlord. You know, finding a tenant is, is step number one. There's, there's, a, there's a multitude of aspects that need to happen correctly uh, once that's completed. So that's where we started to formulate a, a actual property management business that offered everything. So from finding the tenant to collecting the rent, to doing the inspections, to dealing with maintenance, to helping them oversee landlord and tenant board paperwork, which is the kind of uh, regulatory government body that that oversees uh, you know property management um, tenants landlord relationships so most owners didn't have a, a thorough understanding of, of what that looked like and what that would take so we began to, to grow this business and and another important point too is most investors in real estate you know they, they have families they have careers they have they have hobbies they have lives most investors that I meet, because I'm also a real estate agent and I sell investments, they're not bored at home looking to become busy, right? They have some money that, that they've accumulated through savings, maybe it's equity in their home, uh, and they want to invest, whether it's for their future, you know, their kids' uh, education, retirement, whatever it may be. They have the capital, they want to invest, but they truly want a passive experience. Um, in most cases, not every investor, but but I would say a strong, strong percentage of of, of those investors. So, again, we 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 knew um, that there was a big demand for it in this area, and and we began to to really start to develop and grow this this property management business. So, we offer two different services. So it's a straight leasing service where a landlord or investor uh, just hires us to find them a tenant. For that service, we charge one month's rent. Uh, plus HST, we compile the lease, we do a credit check, security background check, uh, ensure all utilities are in their names, um, make sure they have tenant insurance, that sort of stuff. And then there's the full package uh, that we offer, which is a tenant placement and, and some of those things I mentioned earlier where we deal with literally everything. So our fee structure, just to give you guys some background, is, is once you sign up and we manage your property, it's 75% uh, of one month's rent. It's 8% off the gross monthly rent as the management fee. And it's $180 for the entire year. So it's $45 every quarter. We go into the home and actually do an inspection, check the smoke alarms, check the fire alarms, um, do a damage. And we originally called it a, a fire inspection. And then tenants started to ask us why we were looking in the closets and, and checking every square inch of the home. So we had to incorporate that it was also a damage inspection. So our investors really like that. and. Um, uh, for any people that are on this looking to either manage people's homes or they're, they're, they're investors themselves, 
it is important to check in your into your investment and and to see how things are going and not to be intrusive with the tenant right because they're paying rent it's their space you want to respect that but it's important to to check in and and make sure uh, your your investment is is being well cared for and and you can also catch preventative things maybe there's something that you you see while you're there that it's a quick fix then it would be a big fix in six months nine months a year down the road um, so everything we've done has been to streamline the process um, make it you know design our business so we can scale help more and more owners um, make sure we have a good a good environment for our staff to work in. Um, and, and that's, that's been making those decisions, like bringing someone like pay prop in. So I don't need 15 people trying to collect rent. Cause I did it myself. I was, I was, I was collecting, it took me like eight days a month to sit there and receive e-transfers manually input emails to clients, move money around. It was a nightmare. Um, but we didn't have the resources at the time to, 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 to hire uh, a company. Um, and you know, when we did, it was, it was an enormous game changer and, and these guys have been great for us. And, uh, and, and I strongly believe we wouldn't have been able to scale the way that we have, uh, if we didn't bring, uh, someone like PayProp on board and, and our clients love it. And it's a, it's a huge selling feature for us. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a big part of our initial conversation with a new investor or a landlord about why they should choose orange list. You know, we have this excellent payment software that, that's, that's, that's very organized, very streamlined, very user friendly, uh, and the feedback we get is is phenomenal. Um, so we're we're obviously very happy that uh, that we work with you guys. I don't know if you want to ask me some questions. Yeah, yeah I'd I love to. Dig I'd into love the, to. Uh, Eric, <laughs> a beautiful compliment. So, so I mean, Eric, I got I got I got three questions in my mind for you. So, so the one is, I mean, do you guys go further up the chain where you 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 have a guy that walks through the door and says, "I've got money, go find me something, renovate it." pull it all together and I mean do, do you go that far up the chain absolutely so the the term one-stop shop is certainly something that we offer so like I said I, I'm a real estate agent uh here in Niagara I have a real estate team called the investment team because we specialize in investment real estate that's that's certainly our niche so essentially we you know whether it's existing clients that we try to convert to buy more or new investors that, that call us Essentially, we source the property. We know in our area what's going to rent for the most money, what's going to attract the best quality tenants, what's going to appreciate well. I mean, obviously, I don't have a crystal ball to know exactly what the market's going to do, but if something you know drastic was going to was going to change, what areas would still be would be in high demand and 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 hold their value? Um, every investor is different. Some people have small risk tolerance. Some people have larger risk tolerance. So you know, I have to work. Uh, work with that investor to kind of determine where they're at and, and essentially yes i find them the investment before it even closes so we get a firm offer let's say it's a 30 or 45 day closing in that in that escrow period i begin bringing in the architect this is an example of, of converting a single family home to a duplex i'll bring in the architect before the, the client owns the house i'll do the drawings okay from those drawings after my client likes it and we like the floor plan we'll then do the construction drawings Okay. Once I have those construction drawings, I can then pass them over to one of my trusted contractors. I work with four or five different teams. They then generate a quote. Once the quote's generated, I bring it to the client and we negotiate and figure out, okay, we're going to do this, not do this. And then that's done. That's a big part of it. At the same time, I look for properties more, maybe the main level, let's say we're going to do a duplex where we add a basement suite. Maybe the main level is already ready to go. All we have to add is let's say laundry. I will start beginning to rent that unit before the client owns it. So I'm now, I'm now able to try to shoot for higher rent because my client doesn't own it yet. So I can kind of push that threshold and see, I can test the market a little bit. Wow. So I try to maximize and accomplish as many things for my investors as I can in that period, because it's not costing them money yet. They put down the deposit, they don't close for 30 days, 45 days, and I get all that stuff done. So by the time it closes, and, the, and everything's organized, boom, they apply for the permit, right? Now we have our permit to add that legal accessory dwelling unit, for instance. Uh, my contractors go in, we renovate it. Hopefully the upstairs in most cases is already rented. So there is some income being generated. Um, and then we do the renovation. And then when it's done, we list the basement unit, for instance, we get that rented. Uh, and then we oversee the investment uh, throughout its life uh, to make sure that it's, it's managed accordingly. It's generating the income that I've told my investor it's going to generate. 
Uh, and that's another big thing. It's, it's not necessarily that we do everything because we're greedy and we want our hands in every single pocket. It's because we're effective at controlling the experience and the results. Um, and, and that's what we want because, as you know, as you guys have all heard, I'm sure you can have a great experience investing in real estate or you can have a nightmare. Um, and we work really hard to ensure that it's a good experience. So those people can actually build long term wealth through real estate. And as many of you know, one bad investment can set you back years. So, so I've got a question here from a gentleman called Paul that says, what are you charging for project management for the renovations? So in some cases, on like I say, a twenty to thirty thousand dollar project, I don't charge anything. It's it's part of uh, of the service that I provide. Now, if you get into a, a larger renovation, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand, um, you know, sometimes I'll I'll charge five, six hundred dollars a month. Um, it also depends on the size of the project. You know, it could be a thousand, it could be two thousand. It's not a lot. And the reason we don't charge a lot is I work with people that I really trust. I'm not. I'm involved obviously in all the ways that I kind of just told you, I'll check in, I'll pick colors, I'll, I'll design floor plans to maximize the rent. It's, it's for me, these are clients that I'm going to have for life. And I'm more mm -hmm. concerned about getting them into the right investment. Obviously I make money when I sell the house or my business makes income from off, off the fees that we charge. Um, I'm not overly concerned about making money off of every little thing, but of course, if it's a big project, you know, we're certainly um, charging something. So, Again, most of my investors, they buy two, three, five, ten properties. So for me, the, the relational aspect is what's most important. And uh, making sure that investment is, is built in, and designed in a certain way is what's most important. So again, we're very transparent. People know if, if you're being charged for something, you'll, you'll know. It's, uh, it's not a hidden fee yeah. by any means. So, so what you've done, what is fascinating, is, is, is something that's completely different to the norm. So what we usually see in... in in a lot of the businesses we deal with. If someone is a sales business and they accidentally sell to, a, by accident, sell to an investment landlord. And then they say, oh, I got these three properties and I need to manage. You've really turned that around and you've said, well, I, I'm, I'm going to actively look for investment landlords. This is my core business. My, my sales business feeds my rental business. We're very yeah. often in the rental game, it's the other way around where people say, well, you know what? The rentals are just there to keep one or two landlords happy, but I'm actually into sales. You've actually flipped that whole funnel around to say the sales are there to feed my stock rather yeah. than my stock is an accidental consequence of me selling. And, and it's, 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 it, it feeds off each other, right? Like the, the best part is when I'm selling these investment properties, my, my, I'm, I'm putting better properties into my management portfolio because I only sell stuff that I would buy myself. So these are properties that generate a lot of income that are in really good areas that attract really good high quality tenants. So my leasing staff and my, 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 my entire staff are excited because they, these are good properties that we're adding on. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, it, it, I work with a lot of other realtors and big organizations where I help those agents. Um, you know, they, they might be looking at a property for, for their client. They'll call me like I've had two calls since I've been on this. Uh, on this webinar from agents that I work with probably asking me, hey, what do you think of this house? What do you think of, of this basement? How much can we get? So, you know, it's, 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 I've definitely kind of positioned myself as a, as a leader in this area, which is, which is really cool. Um, because, it's, you know, as much as I love growing a business and, and trying to become successful and help people, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm helping a lot of people, uh, my own clients, other clients, other realtors build wealth and, and, and try to look at the market in, in a way that it should be looked at. Um, you know, for instance, an example is people think more bedrooms equals more money. And in Niagara region and in, in like basement units, for instance, that's not the case, right? If you can build a big, my floor plans are big one bedrooms with walk-in closets that rents for more money and faster. And that's sure. not a, that's not a well-known thing here. And, and you, you hear all these other webinars and, and, and read books and listen to podcasts where, where now in Hamilton, for instance, which is about a 30 minute drive from here, that market, more bedrooms does equal more rent. And that's only a 30 minute drive. So you've got to understand, you know, if you're working with an investor right now or a realtor, sorry, you know, ask those kind of questions because it's important to make sure you have the right team from the property management to the real estate. And, and if, you know, those, if they can't answer those questions, you know, whether it's a friend or family member, everyone knows an agent, maybe it's time to, to, to look elsewhere for, for someone to help assist you. I, I think what you've done beautifully is, is that you've, you've moved from, you, you understand what you're selling. A lot of people sell administrative services. They say, I will collect the rent 
and do X, Y, Z, but, but you're offering investor services. You're saying, I, I will find a format and I will maximize that format based on you know what's going to make the most money for you that that to me is about i'm, I'm, I'm gonna maybe basements work better maybe larger bedrooms work better i've got one more question for you eric i mean you've done an incredible thing you've doubled your business well when we look at it that way you've doubled you almost doubled your business you have actually in the last year what are some of the challenges you had with that scale definitely um one if i could give any advice it's constantly reinvest you know, as, as, a, as a business owner, I'd be lying if me and my partner haven't sat down and, and, and asked each other, you know, when can we give ourselves a nice pay raise? You know, when, when, can, we, uh, when can we travel more? When can we, you know, it's, it's I, I don't think that question could ever be, be answered because if you're, if you're not growing, you're shrinking. Um, and I think you mentioned that in your introduction. And that's such an important point, right? If, if you're not moving in a certain direction, uh, your, your business is shrinking and, and we don't want to be doing that. So honestly, moving the right people into the right positions at the right time, uh, don't be afraid to, uh, to invest in, in a, in a, in a software or a, or a service like pay prop, you know, at, at the beginning, I'm not saying pay props fees are, are, are super expensive. They're not, they're extremely reasonable and fair. Um, but obviously as a, as a business owner, any new expense that you add needs to be well calculated. Um, make that decision, you know, and, and, and I, if I could give advice, I wouldn't have waited as long. I think I would have scaled faster if I would have brought them on sooner. Now, obviously, if you don't have the money, you don't have the money, right? But, you know, try to structure your business in a way where, where you can find the resources uh, to make those decisions. And you know what, we, we offer full benefits packages here. Um, we give our staff pay raises. They can all hear me. I'm talking loud. You know, it's important <laughs> that, that, that they're happy. Um, you know, and it's stressful, right? Like I, I mean, I'd be lying if I said my, my staff weren't overworked sometimes and, and, and in a position where, you know, they, someone maybe quit or, or we picked up a lot of new properties, but we're very quick to make an adjustment and, and to ensure that we have enough labor, ensure that we have the right systems and processes in place, uh, to continue giving our staff a good experience, but also giving our, our clients a good experience. Um, it never ends. Don't, don't ever assume that you have some magic machine that's finally done. And, and, it, and you know what I mean? It's maybe that day will come for us, but to me, it's, it's, you're, you're never done implementing new processes and systems to improve things. Um, and, and constantly trying to, to, to test the market, right? You know, how can we do this better? You know, we we're doing it great. People are happy, but how can we do it better? Um, that would be, uh, would be one of my, one of my big pieces of advice to, to give people is, you know, don't ever assume something's good enough. Constantly look to improve it and make it better. Um, and, and your growth will be a reflection of, of that effort and, and attention to detail. Well, Eric, thank you so much for your time and your insight and your willingness to share for us. I know we're, we're a bit limited for time, but I, I can listen to you all day. I mean, I think you've, you, you, you've proved that you've done it and it works and you've taken a very different approach and it's been very successful for you. So, so, so thank you so much. Thank you Thanks. for Thanks sharing for having me. Talking about it. Uh, Charlene and John, I see you've asked some questions. We're gonna answer them. I just wanna uh, introduce Marwan and then get Marwan to talk and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not losing your questions. I'm gonna get back to them. Eric, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Marwan, how are yes, you, sir? How are you? Good morning, I'm, everyone. I'm very well, thank you. Now for everyone, Marwan Matas from um, One Miami Realty in Miami. Yes, and sir. Um, you've been a client for about a year of ours, one of the, the, the early ones down in Florida. Yes. And um, so I'm, I'm going to, uh, like the interesting thing about Marwan, and then I'm going to let him talk about, about his own business, is, is when we look at Marwan's business, now I'm standing outside of this, is we look at Marwan's business and he plays in a different price class than the norm. I mean, the average rental, the median rental in, in, in the US is about $1,100, in Miami it's about $1,300, and Marwan plays in a bracket slightly above that. And, and, and if you go to his website and you have a look at One Miami Realty, you'll see they position themselves as this really slick, beautiful Miami firm. And they really play the Miami firm part beautifully because they play in this really higher category. But I was very interested um, for a couple of reasons that I'll share just now to, to have Marwan on this call to, to share a bit of his experience with us. So, so Marwan, just give us a little bit of introduction about your business. Okay, so uh, my company is uh, One Miami Realty. We're located in the uh, Doral area of uh, the... Uh, metropolis of uh, Miami, very close to the uh, airport. And the good thing about Miami 
it's um, that has uh, a very uh, good weather the all year round. So that makes it very attractive to uh, many visitors and especially to investors. So my business is uh, like Eric's is one stop uh, office. We, we do all in one and we don't charge anything extra for um, advisors. I mean, for uh, loan, for insurance. We provide this as an extra, as a complimentary service to our customers. That makes uh, our customers very uh, happy and um, satisfied with uh, our services. My company started in, uh, I mean, my business actually in 2004, about 16, 17 years ago, but One Miami Realty itself as a company, as an independent company, started about seven years ago, eight years ago. Oh. And uh, I started uh, selling uh, to investors um, low profile properties for $100,000, 150. And little by little, I mean, by the time I got more uh, confident and uh, my customers were very excited about the investment and they saw that the, the, the properties are gaining not only uh, monthly income by renting it, but uh, and the uh, equity. And when they wanted to sell the property for more, uh, I mean, overpriced, they were very excited and they decided to invest uh, more and more. And that's what uh, I, that encouraged me to uh, make my level a little higher than when I started before. So instead of offering properties for 100, 150, I started to offer 200, 250, 300, and then I started to even sell property for over a million dollars. So obviously, uh, but at the end of the day, when you do the calculation and the, the, the goal and the purpose of our business is to make everyone happy and every uh, investment as a good investment. So you have to make it win-win. You Obviously, if I sell properties for $1 million, my commission is way higher than selling properties for $200,000. And you do exactly the same job, the same effort to sell 200 or to sell 1 million. It's the same job. But on the other hand, the, the return of the property as a monthly income, I mean, uh, if you do the, the math, the percentage, you get more income when you sell low price properties. I mean, mid-size, I, I would say $100,000, but as the property is higher in price, the return is lower. I mean, the percentage of the, of the uh, return is lower. So that guides me to uh, set a price for my investment between 300 and 400. That's the best price to sell property to get more income. Well, wow, that, is, that is interesting. Yeah, that's here in Miami. I don't know, maybe somewhere else is, is different. But here in Miami, it works like that. I mean, the best price to sell your property, I mean, to, to have an investment property for, don't get me wrong, I'm talking about monthly income I mean, yeah. as a return, monthly return. It's between 250 or 300 to 400. That's the best. So, so for everyone out there, I mean, that's interesting. You have someone who's done the math and has has done it in experience that it, sometimes you get the guys that say, I want to buy the paint, a paint house for a million. But your ROI sum doesn't work out. That calculation is an important one to do. Well, what can I get you in exactly. a monthly rental that because actually the rent doesn't compensate the investment, the yes. monthly rent. Okay. So, but in those properties over a million dollars, maybe uh, you can get more equity and you make more money when you sell it. But if you're looking for monthly income, the the best price is between two fifty and four hundred. So, so, so I, I started to work with those type of investments. Or investors and uh, after that I tried like Eric to maintain those clients happy by renting the property for them and mm -hmm. then to collect the rent for them because they're most of my clients are foreign national they don't live here in Miami there are foreign investors so if you uh, sell them the property and you say goodbye then you're going to lose that client because he's never going to get back to you because now he has a property that he doesn't know what to do with it 
or he doesn't have the time, he doesn't have the, 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 the knowledge to manage this property. So I started to manage the property for them. And I started to collect the rent mm -hmm. manually like Eric at the beginning. I, was go I, I used to go to and knock the door and collect the check and then go to the bank, deposit that check, and then right. write an email for, for, the, uh, for the landlord with an Excel sheet. This is the rent, this is my commission, this is the HOA, whatever, all expenses, and send them that spreadsheet for them to know what's going on with, the, with their properties. And that made my, my client very uh, happy because they knew about the effort that I'm spending every day to make the property profitable. So, so Marwan, I have a question for you. And when you moved from like the 150s to the 350s, I, in my mind, I have this, this visual of uh, Uber versus Uber Black. When I, when I get into Uber, I just expect to get from A to B. When I get into Uber Black and there's a bottle of chilled water and a sanitizing mask and whatever, I got like, yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm paying extra, but I'm, I'm getting a little extra, right? When, when you moved from the one price category to the other, was the expectation of the bottled water you'd provide, did, did that change because of your type of investor change? The, these these complementary services that you offer, did they become yeah, different? Of course. Of course. The, the more you give your client, uh, it make him more happy. So mm -hmm. as far as the investment is getting good return and they are satisfied with your service, they are loyal to you. So they're not loyal actually to you as a person. They're loyal to your service, to, your, to their expectation. If they get what they expect, then they're loyal to you. And then you can provide something else and then, then they trust you and you move them from one level to the next one and make them more, more confident and uh, you know, encourage them to invest more and more. I love that they're loyal to the expectation of your service. They're not loyal to you. So they expect something and if you give it to them, they're gonna stay with you. If you stop giving that, they, they, of they course. go away. I mean, yeah, they, they're loyal to your service. As far as you give them good service, they are loyal to you. So, so I have a question here, which I've heard from a lot of Miami people that says from Charlene Darby that says, are you finding your owners are selling their investments because the market's really hot right now? Is that something you're seeing in Miami now? Yes, the market is very hot now, especially after the pandemic, I mean, or during the pandemic, as a result, uh, because of the weather of maybe the way that we handle the, uh, the, the uh, pandemic, the, a lot of people actually coming from Canada, coming from New York, coming from Los Angeles, coming to Miami to rent and to buy. So uh, the rent price went over 30, 40% in the last three, four months. And wow. the properties are, I mean, selling faster than, than before. At the beginning of the pandemic, like uh, the first quarter of uh, 2000, I mean, 2020, we were very, very slow. And the mm -hmm. second quarter were completely dead. But now you put a property in the market and you sell it for maybe 10 days and you have multiple offers. So the, the pandemic uh, is helping us. I mean, yeah. And, and, and then, Robert, I mean, with, with, with that hot market, obviously what happens, you get sort of a shrinkage in stock and then a growth in stock. People are fighting to, to buy apartments at the moment. How do you, through that mix, find more stock, find more landlords, grow your portfolio? Because you've been remarkably successful at that as well. I mean, your portfolio has grown tremendously. So where everyone's elbowing each other out to get the next investment property, you've been really successful in managing to get that investment landlord. What do you do differently? Well, um, obviously, when we uh, uh, hire a company like Prop, it helps us to have more time to, to invest in our properties. So instead of um, going to uh, knock the door and collect the check and writing emails and do the, the uh, conciliation manually, that time now I invested in something else, which is visit the properties, advertisement, and uh, given more services. And that obviously makes the, the, the client more, uh, happier and more confident. Absolutely, absolutely. 
And um, then, then, I mean, any advice that you have for people in this? Um, and I know you were quite surprised initially when we spoke about you're in a high end market relative to the norm, but, but you really are in a, in a very different price bracket. I mean, dealing with high end landlords that are not necessarily where you are based, that communication and keeping them up to date, how, how, does, that, how does that work for you? Well, uh, we do, I mean, I call personally my client every, I mean, twice a month at least. I shoot them an email every once in a while. Uh, beside of the, uh, the invoice that goes automatically from paper. Mm -hmm. So I'm always with, uh, in touch with them. I'm always in, in communication. I let them know what's going on with the, uh, with the property. And as uh, uh, anything wrong goes with the property, we fix him, and that is seamless to, to, the, to the owner. He doesn't know, I mean, the owner doesn't know what's going on in, in, in a specific uh, problem. Let's say something broke, like the fridge or the AC. Since we have uh, as a, uh, an addendum to our contract that the uh, tenant is responsible for a certain amount of money to repair everything. Okay, so okay. most okay. of the repairs, they get fixed without the landlord knowing what's happening. And that is, I mean, after that happens and after it got fixed, I let them know by the uh, email or by whatever, I mean, communication, calling, phone call, listen, that what happened and we fixed it. And how much, and he asked how much I'm supposed to pay? Zero, because we took care of it. Yeah, and that's it's like the Uber Black yeah. service that you get, right? Yeah, like, so it's all that included. Make, make and they don't even know. Yeah. That make them very, very happy. So, like eighty percent of problems that go inside the property, that seamless to the to the owner. That is incredible. That is incredible. Yeah. So, and like you said, when you were saying that, uh, check on your fee list if that is legal and if your contract allows you to do it. So we do have an addendum with maybe about 20 clauses, different, I mean, side of the contract, when we explain everything that we can charge and what the, uh, uh, the tenant's responsibility and what the landlord's responsibility. So okay. everything is covered. That's interesting. Everything. So you solve the argument before it happens, because very often when it happens, I mean, where I stay, you know, the dishwasher breaks. And then there's an argument with the landlord that says, well, is this my problem? Is this your problem? So you, you define sort of beforehand, you try to draw the lines about what, exactly. what, what would you be yeah. paying yeah. for? Okay. Exactly. So the first 250, in most of cases, it's uh, the tenant responsibility. So anything cost less than 250, that's 100% wow. out of the uh, tenant's pocket. If it costs $500, uh, $500, so the tenant pays $250 and the owner pays $250. I've, I've, I've never heard of that. That's smart. That's brilliant. Well done. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like deductible. It's like you have a car warranty. Yeah. That's whatever. I mean, if there is $200 or $250 deductible from any repair, from any replacement. <laughs> that makes the owner like free of worries because 90% or 80% of repairs are under 250. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm just getting used to the American healthcare system and everything has got a deductible. So I think consumers are in that place. Exactly. You know, what is, exactly. I, I know it should be included. And that is covered by, uh, if not covered by the contract, it's it covered by the uh, addendum. So Excellent. everyone signs and everyone agrees to it. Oh, Marwan, thank you so much. It's awesome to have you, Marwan. It's wonderful to thank learn you, from your thank experience. Thank you very much for having me. And, uh, I'm here anytime you want. Wonderful. I, I got a question here from, from a John McMillan, and it's and, and it's specifically for Eric. He says, um, I'm just going to read from him. Here. He says, the problem that I'm having at this time with the hot real estate market in COVID is that I'm I've got existing clients leaving and no new ones coming in. And what are your thoughts on that? And he's asking, a, is there a solution, or do you think the market's going to change down the road? So it's a very Canadian question. It's, it's basically a view on. What is your view on the Canadian market where it is at the moment with landlords selling and buying and leaving and moving? So just to clarify, so is, is he has clients leaving his management, like selling their properties and he's not yeah. bringing on new ones. Yeah. It so like one it. Of, yeah. Like the, the Marwin, our, our market here is, is crazy as well. Um, uh, sales are up 200% in, in some cities prices have increased, you know, 
20, 30 percent. It, it's insane over the last year. So um, one of the things I've done and, and you can do, John, is, is there's ways to play with things. For instance, I've now pushed all of my investors to stretch the mortgage from 25 years over to 30. OK, that'll lower that gross mortgage payment down a little bit. Another thing you can do on a multi-unit property is, is split the hydro meter. So I used to offer all inclusive rent. For, 30, for here, the cost is about 3000 to 4000 You split the hydro meter. Some cities let you split the water meter. You have two water meters. You can pass those costs off to your tenant. Um, and this is in a multi-unit, for instance, like a two-unit property or three-unit property. Um, what that does is when I run the ROI, right, <clears throat> I list, you know, the low-end rent to the high-end, and then I subtract all those expenses, and I do it off the low-end rent because that's the worst-case scenario. Um, what you can do is if you implement those strategies, you no longer have to account for those expenses. That will improve the cash flow. So in a rising, rapidly growing real estate market where, where you know, the rents don't match the real estate market at the same time. They do, but it's usually in, in a period afterwards. We're starting to see it now. So the real estate market for the past eight months has been nuts. Rents are now going up over the past 30, 40 days. I've, I've now put higher rents on my ROI. So I don't know. I work with a good mortgage broker. I know Marlon mentioned that. I offer those, all those relationships that I offer. People don't come at a cost. It's whatever they charge the client. Um, I, I work with people that, that offer and specialize in the stuff that I do. My mortgage broker has an extensive background in investing in real estate and, and what tools are available, what lenders are offering what. That's important stuff that when you introduce your investor over to your team, I call these guys my team because they are, I know that they're going to give that investor whatever options they can that'll work best for their situation. So people are like, oh, you can't make money in, in renting anymore. It's the real estate's too expensive. That's not true. I'm finding investments, even though I thought that myself. I'm like, holy frick, how am I going to make this work? Um, you can make it work. And, and, and if you can't make it work, it's not the right investment. Carry on. Look for something else mm -hmm. that will generate the rent numbers. And you can manipulate and move stuff around to make sure your investor's making money. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, uh, those are yeah. some of the things that I've been doing. So it's trying to, to fix the mismatch between what the capital return I can get from selling and what I'm currently getting as rental and to seeing that, um, how do I actually convince you to not sell by making the investment more attractive and upping your ROI? So another thing too, John, um, you can have, instead of your client selling, because they sell the asset and it's gone, you, why don't you try to like what I've been doing? I have people call me, hey, Eric, I want to sell. Why don't you refinance, pull some of that equity out and buy another one? Right. Like like one of the ways to, to, to make a lot of money in real estate is to hold your real estate. And I'm not saying there's never a good time to sell. There obviously are times where you liquidate and, and move on. But in a lot of cases, if, if the real estate market's gone up, their investments have gone up, you can kind of pivot their thinking from, you know, you can leverage that that one investment or those five, whatever they own, instead of liquidating them, leverage them to buy more. Right. Yeah, that's and, and that's the other thing we've been doing. And again, having a good lender. Um, or, or, or somebody that, that understands that space very well can help educate your client and, and bring that um, validity to, to what you're kind of saying. And, you know, and, and in turn, you know, they might take that, 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 that instead of taking that $300,000 uh, payday where they got to pay capital gains and all that stuff, mm. you know, you pull it out in a loan, right? No tax, dump it into something else. And now they've just acquired a whole other asset and now they have, you know, multiple, multiple streams of, of, of appreciation and, and, and income from the rents and, and so on. That is super smart. Moen, um, do you think that, I mean, it's probably putting you a little bit on the spot because, I mean, I've seen prices in Florida just go crazy at the moment. Do, do, do you think this is a sustainable price increase? Do you think it's going to go up or down? Is this a, I hate the word bubble. I don't think it's a bubble, but I think it's just a rapid escalation. Do you think it's going to come down or is this where we are now? Yeah, it's not a bubble. Definitely, it's not a bubble. Uh, Miami is, uh, you compare it to any other uh, big city, the price is still lower than uh, Chicago, New York, LA, San Diego, whatever. So I, my expectation is the price to keep going on, keep going up and up. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not going to be uh, like a sharp like this, but constantly is going to be obviously higher and higher every day. Mm. You know, we've, we've 
in, in, in our South Africa experience, we've seen, you know, everyone talks about these boom and bust cycles in property. And we've seen that now is the time to, to hold on to your rental portfolio because often what people do at this time is when they've got these split businesses where I go, I've got rentals and I've got sales. The sales are really hot right now and they, they invest all their time and effort into growing their sales business and they neglect their rental business. So when times are good, everyone runs into sales and they, they're like rentals feels too, like, like too much hassle. The smart people use this time to grow their rental businesses while people are buying turn them into investment property. So that when the times turn, you've got this annuity income that's, that's built up over time. That's brilliant. Yeah, so, and an important, yes. yeah, if I could add one, one, one good thing that I think everyone, and I, and, I, and I tell this to people all the time, in 2007 and 8, when the, when the housing market crashed, and at its worst in the United States, it was down 25%. If you look at those charts, rents were unaffected. From 2008 to 2012, they held strong. And in 2012, they started skyrocketing again. So that's the other thing to tell people that are like, well, what if I buy in now and, and I rent it and then something happens in the market? I'm not saying that, that what happened 12 years ago is a perfect or 13 years ago is a perfect replica of what may happen again. But it's very reliable data that we can look at and say, well, the demand for housing is still going to be there. You know, mm -hmm. maybe the short term vacation stuff changes, but the demand for people that need a place mm -hmm. to live will never change. So, so you only lose no different than the stock market. If your stock plummets, if you sell it, you take that loss. If you hold it and it recovers and you sell it, then you haven't lost. And no different than the real estate market. You're, you're, you might buy an asset at 500, but if you buy it properly in a good area that attracts good tenants and high rent, if something happens, if the market corrects 10, 15, 20%, if mm -hmm. your rents are still generating, you hold it. It's, it's producing, it's an income producing asset um, that you don't have to sell. I mean, I mean, there are people are in situations, maybe they have to sell, that's unfortunate. But um, if you can hold that asset and it's covering itself, a good asset should be able to cover itself and produce extra income. There's no need to sell and you can weather those storms. Um, and, and that's really why, you know, buying real estate is one of the best ways to invest uh, uh, capital okay. by far. So the key is to have a good leverage. If you are under water, no matter what, I mean, it, you, you're going to lose. But if you are, I mean, you put good down like 50% or more, even if the price goes down a little bit, like Eric just said, the rent is going to keep going and going to cover your, your, your expenses. As far as you're over the water, not under the water, you can hold it and you're going to make money in, in the short or long term. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. We've just run out of time. And I just want to summarize, you must correct me if I'm wrong here. I'm, I'm going to try and take your, your wisdom and condense it to 10 things, which I'm probably going to do very badly because I, <laughs> you guys are extraordinarily intelligent. But the 10 things I took out of it, so, so, so what I, I mean, I'm going to start, we're going to start with, with, um, with, with Eric. And I mean, what I loved was to see how you invert the model that your sales business feeds your rental business and not the other way around. To me, that was like a light bulb moment. I, I love what you do with the escrow period. I love how you go and say, well, there's this time that's dead space where people are just like gnawing at the, the nails and going, is it gonna clear? Use the time to experiment to see, to see what works. But what, what I loved was how you say, well, you know, don't just buy the property and rent it. Maybe the format of the property is different. Maybe it's a, it's a basement or, a, or an extra room. So understand the formats that make you, make you the most money and, and and what i love about how you look at property is you don't look at it from how do i make this sale you look at it from an investor's point of view you know what is my what is the return i can generate you and how do i maximize it and that's something that i got from Mar and as well that says if you don't understand the roi model of your investor you're just going to sell a property and administer it you, you're not going to make money for that person because you're an asset manager so you're going to someone and say well what is the yeah. asset class in which you're going to make the highest return. So, so for, 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 for both my one and Eric, to think like asset managers has been, been really, really important. I mean, for, 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 from my one, so the fifth thing for me was about how this uber black model in my mind of what are the extra things that I need to offer at this higher price point that these type of people expect? You know, this, this I, I love your $250 thing, by the way, I'm going to do that. That says, you know, ultimately, the landlord doesn't want to know. And the less I know, you know, the better. If I get the money, I get through to that's really great. Exactly. I, I, I think, I mean, loyal to the experience of your service and not to you as an individual, something that keeps us humble, that says you might like me, but the moment my service drops as much as you like me, you, you, you're going to drop. So, so being able to, whichever category that you play, understand the service expectation 
and then deliver it consistently is important. That that's what builds businesses, right? It's not yeah. about just because people focus in the sales game on rapport. You know, people that like me, people buy from people that they like. That's true. But if I've got an expectation of service, that's what you 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 come back for. Um, what, what I loved about what you said, Mo, and also is about investing time in the right things. So you're investing time in making phone calls to your landlords, talking to them, how are you doing? This is what's happening on your property. I'm only going to bother you to build our relationship further. I'm not going to bother you about things that don't bother you. I'm going to, I'm going to spend my time not administering my business, but growing my business. And to me, that was, that was really, really great. Um, Eric, there was something else interesting that you brought to the table that was about, well, what I loved towards the end, what you were saying about partnerships. This is, you can have a good team of people around you. It doesn't help that you're just an agent in isolation. You've got to have a good mortgage guy that, and, and you've got to understand what are the implications of taking a 25 year mortgage and making a 30 year mortgage and actually, you know, have a guy, right? And um, I love the idea of inverting the landlord problem of the big payday. So what do I do at the big landlord payday where I get the lucrative offer to say, well, now your house is valued at more, which means you can leverage for more. Don't cash in, buy more, you know? So it's, instead of going down the route of, oh, I'm losing landlords, I'm losing landlords, I'm losing landlords, have the conversation with the landlord. I know it's a good time to sell, but it's also a better time to leverage because you're going to get more debt against that property because the equity value is gone. And that was very smart. Yeah. To everyone joining, I mean, I'm supposed to tell you how great PayProp is, but I'm not going to do that because Eric and Marwan has done it for me. So They are great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, they are great. We're going to try and package this in a, in a, in a, in a we're, going to, we're going to send everyone the recording and we're going to try and package some of the learnings. But, but gentlemen, I want to thank you for your time, for, for, for sharing your businesses and your insights so openly and so freely with people from around the world that you've, you've never met. I really appreciate it. And yeah, to everyone thanks. attending, thank you for your time. It's been wonderful to see you. Uh, and, and we look forward to hosting some of, of these webinars again. Thank you very much for joining and investing in, in time and learning and understanding and asking. It's, it's always been great to have everyone. All right. Thank have you a lovely much. day. Thank, thank you so much, guys. Take care. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.